All right. Okay, so in this uh, last part, I want to come back to the question about uh, genome evolution, and in particular, I'll tell a little bit about uh, some recent work that we're doing and trying to finish on uh, how bacterial genomes evolve. And um, just to remind you, yesterday I, saw, I showed this kind of sort of provocative, motivating slide about uh, questions about evolution, um, where I try to make um, an argument that what we should really try to focus on in uh, studying genome evolution is um, to come up with rigorously measurable quantities about um, genome evolution and have tried to find phenomenological laws that these quantities obey. And so uh, yesterday I gave a talk where I went through a number of such phenomenological laws that people have observed. Uh, like the distribution of substitution rates, it's a relation with a RNA expression, gene family size distributions, the scaling laws of how the number of genes in different categories, different uh, functions, scales, the genome size. And so the project that I'm going to talk about today came from our desire to try and extend these kind of things, not to just genomic data, but to start looking at phenotypes. Because at the end of the day, when you look at the genome, you really only sort of see what is encoded in the, in the genotype, but you would like to understand also something about what does this do at the phenotypic level. And so when I made the plan for this proposal, uh, for this project, I, what I decided to do is we're going to isolate wild strains of closely related bacteria from a single habitat. So we're going to go somewhere and catch bacteria that are living in the wild that are all closely related. All right, so they're in one place and they probably, uh, and they're related, right? They're the same species of, of bacteria. And then we're going to sequence their genomes. And the first thing we're going to do is to reconstruct the phylogeny. So we make a phylogenetic tree that says how the strains that we got are related. And then we're going to find out about their phenotypes. And in the case of bacteria, basically what that means is we're going to look across many different conditions, so we're going to give them many different food sources, many different stresses, so we've done about 150 different conditions, and in each of these conditions, we're going to measure which of these strains of bacteria that will live there can grow in this condition or not grow in that condition. So that means that for every strain now, we're going to have a column of phenotypes. It says this strain could not grow in the first condition, could grow in the second condition, not in the third condition, and so on and so on. And then I want to go and develop models where evolution along the branches of this tree has to explain the phenotypes that you observe at the leaves of the tree. And I just wanted to learn something about can I, what are the sort of statistics of the changes in these phenotypes that I have to zoom along these branches. Are they correlated? Are they correlated in certain groups and so on? I just wanted to look phenomenologically what this data looks at. Do I see recurring quantitative patterns? All right, so that was the plan. And as you will see today, that plan already broke down here. Okay? And, um, and I will try to explain to you why it broke down there. Okay. All right, so e evolution of E. coli in the wild. If I say in the wild, this is the wild. Uh, so the group of Mike Sadowski in the U.S. isolated these bacteria. This is at the shore of Lake Superior in Minnesota in the U.S. Uh, there is a car park. Uh, you can let your boat in here. You can go fishing. And they went here by the side of the water, and they took um, samples from right the at the water side from the wet soil at the, at the edge and soil one meter inland. And then from those samples, they isolated E. coli strains. And they made about four plates of 96 different E. coli strains, or five, sorry, there are about 500 strains. But we, today I'm going to focus on the results from one plate <clears throat> of uh, 
92 strains, and we've gotten all the genomes and phenotype data from those. And actually today, although we have all this phenotype data, I'm going to only tell you about the genome data. I'm not going to get to the phenotype part. All right. So the first thing that we did is we made, made, used one of these programs for phylogeny reconstruction to make a phylogeny of these strains. And uh, in fact, actually, we developed a new program ourselves, um, if you want to use it. So basically, what this program does is you don't have to assemble your genomes. You can just have the raw reads from your sequencing and some reference genomes from your species. And then basically, what the program will do is it will identify pieces of the genomes that are shared across all the strains. This is often called the core genome. It's the pieces of the genome that occur in all strains. And align them across all strains. And then use one of these uh, maximum likelihood phylogeny reconstruction algorithms to make a phylogeny. All right? And so here's the phylogeny for our strains together with a whole number of strains from the database. So everything here that is in red is our strains. And so the name of our strain is just the name of the well on the 96 well plate in which that strain was. And uh, it doesn't mean anything. In black are strains from the literature. So these are strains from the database that, uh, that people have sequenced before. And there are also some strains of bacteria that are called Shigella rather than E. coli. This is for some reasons of bacterial species classification is based on phenotype rather than on genotype. And these Shigellas, they, there's something that they do or not do that uh, uh, E. coli does do, but you see they mix in this, in this tree. So phylogenetically, these mix. And in green are some lab strains. And the first thing that we noticed is that <clears throat> we find in that spot at the shore of Lake Superior, E. coli is from all over the known E. coli phylogeny. So the entire diversity that is known from E. coli that have been sequenced all over the world is represented there at that spot at that one point in time. And uh, there are also some E. coli in here that are very far from almost all known E. coli that are so 8% divergence from them. And so this is, was the first observation we made, which is maybe surprise. The other thing is that every one of the wells on this plate had an E. coli that was different from every other of the wells. Okay? So there was no strain of E. coli that occurred twice. So that must mean that the diversity in this region is, is big, right? If there was one strain of E. coli that was responsible for 10% of all E. coli in that spot, we would have seen it more than once. All right, so it sort of says no E. coli strain is present there at more than sort of 1%. Okay, so now what is the meaning of this tree? I want to talk about this today. What's the meaning of this tree? What do people think? Um, so one of the most, uh, I find most uh, inspiring things to think about is the fact that every cell that lives today is the result of a cell division. And those ancestor cells were also results of cell divisions, which were the results of cell divisions, and so on. And this is basically going back all the way to origin of life. So really, all cells in all organisms living today are connected in some cell division tree. There is some huge, insanely big cell division tree in which all everything that lives today is connected. And so evolutionary theory is really just asking about the structure of that tree in a way, right? You can, from a, math, a mathematician might summarize it like that. Um, so that also holds for the strains uh, that we have. So if our, the strains that we sequenced are these, we, in principle, we could trace back their cell division ancestry, and there's going to be some tree in which they're connected. Now, generally, when we sequence the DNA, we hope to reconstruct that tree from DNA sequences, right? So if errors in replication only happen at the replication of DNA and through cell division, then of course, when a mutation occurs, like here, this blue mutation, then it will be shared 
by all the DNA sequences of the organisms that are below that in this tree. And that's the general way in which we try to take the DNA sequences today and reconstruct what this cell division phylogeny is. And so that's how we interpret the meaning of a tree. We interpret this tree to mean showing you the <coughs> ancestral relationships of your strains. However, it's been known for quite a long time that not all DNA is vertically inherited. There are a number of processes that allow DNA from one cell to make it into the genome of another cell. <clears throat> so, for example, some bacteria can take up DNA from their environment. Uh, most bacteria are infected by phages. These phages may carry some DNA of the host that they previously infected. And so now when they infect a new host, they can in inject DNA that came from another E. coli into this E. coli. And then through a process called homologous recombination, so this piece of DNA is going to be homologous because it comes from another E. coli to a piece of this genome. This genome can swap its copy for this uh, um, piece of DNA that was coming from another E. coli. <clears throat> so this is known. And um, uh, so the question is, how does this affect this uh, reconstruction of your phylogeny from um, the DNA sequence? So the first thing that we did is we cut our big multiple alignment. So we have this big multiple alignment of all pieces of DNA that are shared between all these strains of E. coli. So we have 92 strains of E. coli. This alignment is 3 million base pairs long, roughly. All right? So it's 3 million by 92. And we first made an, a phylogeny from using that entire alignment. And then we cut the alignment into blocks of 1 kb long. Okay, so we have about 3,000 blocks. And we also made a phylogeny from each of these blocks. And so the thing that you see is that every block has a different phylogeny when you do this. Okay? Every single block has a different phylogeny. And you may say, well, but maybe some of these phylogenies are sort of within noise of each other. Right? So that given the data, you could, but that's also not true. So if you look at the log likelihood difference under this sort of model, probabilistic model that is used for phylogeny reconstruction, of each tree, so a block, you take its own tree, and then you look at what would be the likelihood of this block under all the other trees from all the other 2,999 blocks. The log likelihood difference distribution that you then get looks like this, and basically, every block significantly rejects the trees of every other block. So it, the data says the phylogeny in every block is different. However, if I take any, let's say, 100 blocks from the 3,000 that I have, I put them together, and I say, now make a tree, I basically always get the same tree. Right. So any one block, they give you a different tree. But if I take any group of blocks, sufficiently large group of blocks, I get pretty much the same tree. A few hundred. <clears throat> and you might not get the identical ones, but they start becoming very, very similar. It's basically the more blocks you use, the closer it gets to the, to the final. Yeah. Well, the pool has to be big enough, right? Yes. And the point is different subsets give you the same, all right? And so my understanding, for, so, the, so this tree that you get when you take a large number of blocks, is that the clonal phylogeny? Is that the, is that the phylogeny of cell divisions? And my sense of the literature is that many people believe, yes, it must be. It must be that you have this horizontal transfer of genes going on all the time, and that causes that if you look at one block, that you always get that somewhere in some strain a piece was recombined, and so you get a different phylogeny. But once you take enough blocks, this sort of starts averaging out, and now you re re recover the clonal phylogeny. And so what I'm going to look at is, do I really believe that that is true? Okay, yes.
And so what I propose is, you'll see, I'll go through what I think is going on, and then afterwards you tell me if that still matches your analogy. Or, all right. We just picked it. We just take the whole multiple sequence alignment and we cut it into chunks. And we here did it with 2KB. You can do it with 1KB or 4KB. You can't do it with 10 base pairs, there's not going to be enough information. So you need to do enough that there's going to be enough mutations falling in this block. There's, in our data, there's a mutation roughly every 10 base pairs. So when you get to 1KB, you have about 100, 2KB, sorry, you have. Uh, um, Yes, you have about 100, 2KB, you have about 200 mutations in there. That's sort of the number you need to get a well-resolved tree. We're going to get to that. <laughs> Hang on. All right. All right. Okay, so this is just what I just said. So now I first want to sort of give you a sort of a sense of what does this multiple alignment look like. All right, so as I said, um, uh, I overstated it a bit, it's 2,650,000 base pairs long, this alignment, and 8.5% of the positions are what's called single nucleotide polymorphism, that is to say, in that position, not every strain has the same letter, so that's 8.5%. Uh, uh, so there is 210,000 of those in total, but 95% of the columns in which there is a SNP, there are only two letters, all right? So you find some subset of your strain have one letter, and the rest of the strains have another letter, but it's very rare to find three letters, okay? So I made here sort of a cartoon, is that as you go along the genome, sort of every 10 letters, you get a, a variant, so many of them have no variation, and then when you have a variant, some subgroup have one letter and some other subgroup have another letter. Okay. And so now the fact that the mutation rate is relatively low and that when you see one, you only see two letters, I interpret this to mean that even though the phylogeny, the history may be different for different parts of the genome, when I focus on one letter, one column, sorry, one column in the alignment, there was a single mutation that happened in the history of this column. Okay. And, but basically what it says is if I focus on this column, so I don't know what the phylogeny is for this column. However, I have one piece of information about this phylogeny. In this phylogeny, the strains A, B, and C must form one subclade, and the strains D, E, and F must form another subclade, and the mutation happened on the branch between those two clades, all right? Because A, B, and C share this, and D, E, and F share that. So basically, the assumption is there are few columns that had two or three or four mutations in their history. But now, uh, so each strain is a bipartition of the set. So at this position, I know E and F form a clade, and the other ones form a clade, and so on. Okay. So now, you can often combine these things, right? So if I take these three SNPs, I can make a tree that is consistent with all of these bipartitions, right? So I've here made a tree, so I've put A, B, and C on one end, and D, E, and F on the other end. That's what this thing tells me I need to do. But this thing tells me E and F have to be a subclade with the other ones on the other. So I made this branch. So this mutation happened here on the ancestor leading to E and F. This mutation happened in the terminal branch to D, and this mutation happened in the ancestor of D, E, and F, or A, B, and C, you can think of it both ways. Okay, is that clear? So I can combine the information from multi multiple columns in my alignment, and each column tells me the phylogeny here gives me a bipartition, and now I can ask, can I combine these different bipartitions to further resolve the phylogeny? Okay. However, I can also have clashes. Okay? So, if I look at uh, 
this column here in black, it tells me B, E, and F have to form a subclade, but this column tells me A, B, and C have to form a subclade. And those, these two things are not compatible with each other. So while these three positions may share one phylogeny because they're mutually consistent with each other, I know that by the time I get here, I need another phylogeny because it's not consistent with previous ones. So we can then start to ask ourselves, how long are stretches along this alignment where the columns are consistent with one phylogeny? How many SNPs in the total alignment are consistent with this core phylogeny? Right? So of this phylogeny that I made from the whole thing, how many of the SNPs in here are actually fall on that phylogeny or consistent with it? And how many SNPs are compatible with any one single phylogeny? All right, so the first thing we found that the stretches of compatible SNPs are short. So this is the distribution of how many SNPs I can go in a row before I, can get, an, before I get an incompatibility. And you see that it's uh, somewhere, uh, you know, typically it's just a few, but it's almost never more than 20, all right? Now I have in total 160,000 SNPs in this alignment, and so that means that the phylogeny must change at least 15,000 times as I go along this alignment. Okay, so the phylogeny changes many, 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 many times, but it could still be that you have, you know, many sort of inserted pieces where you have a, di a phylogeny different from the clonal phylogeny, from the cell division history, but that there are still many, many, many colors, that there is sort of a, a background left of columns that follow this, this clonal phylogeny. So we asked, is there maybe a large set of SNPs even though, you know, the phylogeny changes many times, you get incompatible columns often, maybe there's still a large background of SNPs that are all consistent with one phylogeny. All right. So it turns out that the large majority of SNPs is actually inconsistent with any one individual tree. So first of all, if you take the phylogeny that we made from the entire genome alignments, almost 72% of the SNPs are inconsistent with this. Okay, so the large majority of them are inconsistent with that tree. It's also true that, okay, so the length of the branches in this tree should in principle be uh, proportional to the SNP frequency, and we also find that that is typically orders of magnitude off, but I will not go into details about this. But the point is that the core tree does not capture at all the, the statistics of these SNPs that we find in the genome. And so then we ask, well, maybe the core tree is wrong because it was constructed using an algorithm that assumed there is one tree, and we now know that that's wrong. But maybe I can still find one tree that is consistent with many, many, many of my SNPs. So we devised some algorithms to try and find this uh, tree such that as many as SNPs as possible are consistent with it. If you do that, you can improve from having 71.7% .7 clashes to 71.4% clashes. Okay? So we cannot find any one tree that can account for more than 29% of our SNPs. Okay. All right, so maybe the problem is, so then another thing we thought is maybe the problem is, well, we're trying to find a tree that, that really takes care of all strains but maybe there are just a couple strains that sort of throw a wrench in this thing, right? So if we were to take out a couple of problematic strains, maybe then for the other strains, I can find a nice consistent phylogeny for most SNPs. And so we went to sort of the other end, and we said we're going to look at just quartets of strains. We're going to take groups of four strains. That's the smallest number where you can have a meaningful phylogeny. So if I have four strains, I, J, M, and N, there are four possible typologies. I and J are close and M and M are close, or I and M and J and N, or I and N and M and J. And so when you have these three topo possible topologies, they also correspond to three types of SNPs that may occur, right? So if you find a column where I and J share a letter and M and N have another letter, 
That is suggestive of this topology that corresponds to this topology. If you find columns where I and M have one letter and J and N have another letter, that corresponds to this topology and this one corresponds to that topology. So we took now collections of roughly equidistant strains so that the total distances between them were the same, extracted all columns of this type, right, where two guys have one letter and two guys have another letter, and then asked what fraction of these um, support each of the three topologies. And so um, if there was a single tree, so then, okay, so then what we plotted is for each of these uh, quartets, we looked at what was the total number of SNPs of this kind that we found for this quartet. So th these are groups of closer guys, and these are groups of more distant guys. And then we looked, what is the most common of the three types? And we asked, what is the fraction that clashes with this? So if there really was a topo one tree for these four guys, you, all the points would be here at zero, because full 100% would agree with it and 0% clash. But in fact, we find that somewhere between 25% and two thirds clash, where two thirds is what you would get if it was entirely random. And if it was entirely random, then it would be one third for each case. But you see that for all these, you're nowhere near having a single tree, all right? So even if you go to quartets, you cannot find a clearly dominant phylogeny. All right, so what is going on? So I think the easiest way to see what's going on is you look at a very close pair of strains. So here's a close pair of strains, F3 and E4. Now we aligned this pair of strains. And now we went with a sliding window over this alignment. And then we calculated what is the rate at which SNPs are occurring between this pair. Okay, so it's just a pair of strains. How often do you see a mutation between them? And you see that in the vast parts of the genome, this number is a very low rate. And then there are these sudden blocks where there is all of a sudden a much higher rate of SNPs. Okay? Also, if you map them to each other, you see that there is also some regions that exist in one strain but not the other. Okay, so there are some gaps where there are pieces that one strain has that the other strain doesn't have. But these blocks here, we are convinced, are regions where this horizontal recombination have taken place. So these guys are very close. They had a recent common ancestor. But in the time since that divergence, there have been a couple of events where there was a piece of DNA that came from another E. coli and was inserted, right? The, through homologous recombination, the original copy in the genome was flipped for this distal copy. And so whereas in most of the regions of the genome, the rate of mutations is very, very low, the rate of mutations in these regions is like sort of 1%, 2%, which is the typical distance between randomly chosen E. coli. Okay, so these guys are everywhere very close, except for these few regions where they're as distant as sort of random E. coli to each other. And so we believe these regions have been recombined. So now what you can do for close pairs, you can try to look at uh, this distribution, right? So you can take a sliding window across the genome and ask how many regions are there with zero SNPs, one SNP, two SNP, three SNPs, and so on. You look at the distributions of SNP per region. If you do that for this pair, you get a distribution like this. Okay, so this is the number of SNPs per kilobase. So we, we slide a one kilobase block over the genome. So it goes up from zero to 80 mutations in a block. And this is the fraction of all one kilobase segments for this pair of strains that have so many mutations. Notice this is on a log scale, right? So it starts at 10 to the four here. So you see that the vast majority of blocks have, you know, zero, one, or two SNPs in them. But then there is this exponential tail where there is a small number of blocks, where there is many more going up to 60 and even 80, all right? So this is clearly a bimodal distribution of the number of SNPs per block. And so basically what we decided to do is to fit those distributions with a mixture of a Poisson. So notice, right, so that if um, mutations occur at a fixed rate between these two, 
then the number of SNPs per block that you would expect would be Poisson distributed. So this part, this ancestral part, the part that is still coming from their ancestor, we assume follows a Poisson distribution. And then this other part, we assume follows a negative binomial distribution, which you can think of as a mixture of Poissons with different rates. Okay, because they come from different E. coli that were at different distances, so they're a mixture of Poissons at different rates. It turns out you can do this fitting works quite well with these negative binomials. And so now once we have that fit, we get for each pair of strains, we get three numbers. We get what fraction of the blocks in the genome is still coming from the ancestor versus what fraction has been recombined. What is the average distance right, in the non-recombined blocks, which should really reflect the distance until the ancestor of this pair, and what is the average distance in the recombined regions? And so what I'm showing you here is as a function of the total divergence of the block, right? So minus two means uh, this is a pair of E. coli that are different in 1% of their bases overall. This is 0.1%. This is one in 10,000 bases is different and so on. And on the y-axis, I show what is the fraction of the genome that still comes from their common ancestor that has not yet been recombined. And so you see that for this pair that I just showed you, the SNP rate um, is 10 to the minus 3, uh, the total divergence, and 97% of the genome is still ancestral. But if I go up and I now look at a pair of strains, right? so each dot here is a pair of strains that is at 0.6%, uh, now the fraction of ancestral has gone down to 50%. This is the distribution that you see of uh, uh, SNPs per block. And if you go a bit higher, 0.8, now only 20% ancestral is left. And by the time you get to about 1% distance, basically this ancestral part disappears. And here, so now once we're through this uh, one point something percent, you see you've lo lost this, this Poisson part at the start, and basically the entire genome has been recombined. Realize that the vast majority of pairs is to the right of this. The typical distance of E. coli are one, two, three percent, right? So these guys are actually a minority of guys that are, are, are surprisingly close to each other. So for the vast majority of the pairs of strains that I have in my collection, the entire genome has been overwritten by recombination. This means that if I compare the DNA sequences of this, of this pair, there is no more DNA left that actually came from their common ancestor. And so it means it's become impossible to reconstruct the phylogeny because it's simply the information has been lost. Okay, so up here, up to sort of 10 to the minus 3 total divergence, almost everything has been clonally inherited. And then there is this transition region where basically now the more and more and more of the genome is recombined, and by the time you're at sort of 1%, you lose all DNA from the ancestor. All right, so now we've been playing around with a sort of a simple model for looking at how this works. So for each um, fit of a pair, we extract these three numbers, the fraction of the genome that's clonally inherited, the SNP rate in clonally inherited regions, which is a measure of time since the ancestor, and the SNP rate in recombined regions. And notice that the total divergence between a pair is just this fraction that is clonal times the clonal distance and one minus the, re so this is the recombined part times uh, the recombined distance. So the first thing we asked is that, is this distance the average distance in these recombined parts, does that depend on how close you are in the non-recombined parts? So this is the distance in the clonal regions, SNP rate in clonal against SNP rate in, in uh, the recombined regions. And you find that, well, here you only have one or two of these regions, so there's a lot of fluctuations. But as soon as if you have enough of these recombined regions, the average SNP rate in them averages to at the typical distance of a pair of E. coli, which is about uh, 13 SNPs per kilobase. Okay, so this, 
the, the, the SNP rate in the recombined regions is sort of independent of the distance of the, of the true clonal distance of the pair. And second, um, we find that the fraction of ancestral, so the log of the fraction that is still ancestral, is basically decreasing linearly with the distance between the clonal, uh, with the distance in the clonal regions. That is to say, the fraction that is still cl clonal is roughly dropping exponentially as a function of the time since they diverged from a common ancestor. And so basically this is saying this, the slope of this line, this row, is giving you the rate at which you get these recombined regions, right? So from this data, you can extract two numbers, this rate of recombination and uh, the, the rate in the recombined blocks. And so you can combine that, for example, to in this simple model, if you assume this is constant and the fraction of clonal is going down exponentially, you can actually predict what that curve should look like and it reasonably fits uh, what you see in the data. So it predicts for you at what time you should lose all clonal DNA. Um, so, yes. Yeah. Yeah, this is, okay, so we have in our um, collection, there's eight guys that are much further apart than from the other ones than E. coli typically are. They're at 8% divergence from the rest. No, no, no. Eight, so normally E. coli are sort of in the range of 1% to 3%, right? So somewhere between one mutation per 100 base pairs and three mutations. These guys have eight mutations per 100 base pairs relative to the other ones. And probably some bacteriologists would say that's not E. coli. But it's E. coli according to the phenotypic tests that define E. coli. That's why they're in the collection. And it turns out there is one paper from a Chinese group of a strain that was isolated in Tibet. <laughs> a hamster in Tibet. That's very close to those eight. They called it new species because it's so far away. I don't know. I mean, I'm agnostic as to it, whether it's a different species or not. But somehow, R8 that we found there, the only other thing in the database that's close is coming from a hamster in Tibet. All right. So, um, yeah. Well, in the model, you really at some point have overwritten the entire genome. And then there is zero left. Yeah, yeah. So this is just ask, this is just telling you what you expect to happen, right? So there are the fluctuations around that. Right. So I'm just assuming recombinase block come in at a constant rate. And then you can say, what's the expected time where you hit zero? This is just giving that. I'm not saying that in every realization it happens right there. I should also tell you that one of the reasons that I have not published this yet is that this plot has, okay, so, has some potential artifacts in it from the way that the fitting is done. And I'm now actually believing that there might be different rates for different subgroups of guys and that the, this idea that it's all one rate is really a little bit too simplistic, all right? But I think the general trend of the thing is, is correct. Okay, so from this, you can extract some numbers. So you could, for example, work out what is the distance in real time, right, between a pair of strains, at which half of your genome has been recombined. So it gives you sort of the critical time after which, you know, you're sort of fully recombined. And we find here that is when the rate of mutation in clonally inherited regions is one in a thousand. 
Right? So if you think of the E. coli mutation rate to be 10 to the minus 10, which is roughly what it is, 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus time, 10, then when you get to this rate, you're sort of at a million to 10 million generations. At that point, half of your genome has been recombined. You can also ask, if I take two very, very close genomes, as they start to diverge evolutionarily, and I look at their total distance, the total number of mutations between them, what fraction has come from mutation versus what fraction has come from recombining in pieces from other E. coli that already had mutations on them, then you find that that ratio is about nine. Okay, so between close pairs, even though most of the genome may still be coming from the common ancestor, most of the mutations between them come from recombination. Okay, so recombination really dominates divergence of closed strains. Um, okay, so this is just telling you that you find comparable things when you take other species for which there are in the database lots of strains. So this is for Bacillus subtilis. This ratio is eight. This is already a bit earlier. For Glamidia here, we get this is similar. This ratio is a bit lower. It's four. Um, and so... Actually, for most of the strains where we looked, where we had enough data, we have similar looking things. There are things like mycoplasma, uh, sorry, um, uh, my, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, um, where there are good reasons to think that it should not be able to recombine that much because it only lives inside the host. There is just a case that there's just not enough divergence. They're all very cl close to each other, but we still see evidence of recombination events, even in, in tuberculosis. So I believe that actually for, for most bacteria, I would believe, this recombination really drives genome divergence. Okay? Now, apart from these... Uh, um, apart from the mutations in the core genome, that is in the piece of the genome that everybody notices, has noticed there are also these gaps, right? If I map um, strain F3 to this other strain E4, there are some parts in E4 that are missing in F3. You don't find any, any DNA that looks anything like it. Okay? So you can also ask, how does the amount of genetic, genomic material that is unique to each strain scale with the divergence of a pair? So I take a pair again, and I ask, what is your total divergence? And I ask, how much DNA is there that exists in only one of the two guys and is not shared between them? All right, so that's what you see here. So here is, again, the uh, divergence of the pair, what fraction is different between them of nucleotides that they share. And here is what fraction of the basis in their genome is not shared, okay? So it occur only one of the two. And you see that this everywhere clearly above the line Y is X, right? So, and in particular, once you get recombined, there is much more stuff different due to genomic real estate that one has but not the other than uh, due to um, um, mismatches. So the amount of differences due to unshared DNA is about tenfold higher and differences due to SNPs. And so if you look at the number of genes, for example, this is how many genes only one of the two has, so they're not shared. You see that even in these closed guys, you can have, you know, some 10 to 50 genes that one has and the other one doesn't have. And by the time you're recombined, you have hundreds of genes that one gene has, but not the other. Has. So I believe that if you ask what is driving phenotypic differences between strains, I think it's mostly you have a gene that the other guy doesn't have, or you miss a gene that the other guy has. Then at the next level, sort of one order of magnitude below that, there is you have an allele of a gene that you recombined from somebody that's different from the allele that the other guy has, and then only an, an order of magnitude below that, mutations. Okay. Um, Okay, so this is very noisy. I just want to mention, if you show the, num the log in the number of different genes as a function of the fraction of mismatches, total divergence, it looks roughly straight. It's very, very noisy, right? It also gets the noise goes up. But it's sort of like the number of genes that you have different between you is sort of growing logarithmically with, with the total divergence. I don't really know why. I mean, I can come up with some models, but I think it's kind of an interesting observation. 
All right, so the thing that I now, uh, this uh, last half hour, want to talk about is why is there still an apparent phylogeny? Okay, because I told you if I take enough blocks, I always get a phylogeny. This is just the phylogeny of our guy, so I left out now all the, all the database strains and I made the phylogeny just on our strains. And this is how it looks like. And it doesn't look like a star tree, right? If everybody was constantly swapping DNA with everybody else, then in the end, everybody should be roughly the same distance from everybody else. But that's not what you see. Now, how come that you can have this sort of stable phylogeny when you combine many, many blocks that seems to have a lot of structure, even though I claim that the vast majority of pairs in here have been fully recombined? Okay. So maybe the sort of uh, easiest way to gain some insight in this is that we started looking at, at SNPs that are um, of a particular kind, that is, namely, we look at a SNP that occurs in only two strains. All right? So I find columns in my alignment where only two guys have a letter that is different from everybody else's letter. And in particular, I'm going to look now at columns where the strain A1 is different from the rest, and one other guy is different from the rest. Okay? I, I pulled out these columns. And here I'm showing you the numbers of those. Okay, so you see that there are 212 columns where A1 and A11 have a letter that is different from the letters that everybody else has. There are 12 columns where A1 and E6 have a letter that is different from what everybody else has, and so on. Okay, so we call them pair snips. And what these things say is that whenever I find a column like this, let's say I find a column with A1 and 11, it means that in that part of the genome, A1 and A11 are nearest neighbors in the phylogeny. And the mutation happened on the branch leading to the ancestor of these two. Okay, so if there was only one tree, then there would be only one pair. You can only be a near, nearest neighbor with one other guy, and so all the SNPs of that type would be with one guy. So we clearly don't have that, right? So A1 can be nearest neighbor with many different guys in different parts of the genome. However, if you were just randomly swapping, then you would expect to find every other guy equally often. That's also really not what we find. We find that some guys occur many, many more times than other guys. Okay? So the sort of picture that emerges is, yes, all these guys are recombining with each other all the time, but they're not randomly picking who they're recombining with. Some pairs are much more likely to recombine with each other than other pairs. All right, so if I do this, all these pair snips, but now I don't do just A1 with everybody else, but I do everybody with everybody else, it looks like this. And so this graph shows all the pair snips that I, uh, that I see, and the thickness of these edges is the logarithm of the number of times it occurs. Okay, so you see that you clearly see very different thicknesses. So it means that there is a wide distribution of occurrences of these pair SNPs. Right? Some pairs have a SNP much more often than they share than others. Which again, it, it says there are very different rates of recombination of different pairs of each other. So what we now did is we made a plot of the distribution of thicknesses of these edges. Just sort of how many edges... How many pairs are there? You see one time, two time, three time. All right, that distribution looks like this. All right, so um, it basically, uh, so this is the re reverse cumulative distribution. What fraction of all possible pairs of types occur more than this often? Okay, so there are many, right? So half of them occur, you know, three or more times and 5% occur more than 100 times, and, you know, 1% occur more than 1,000 times. But this is shown on a log-log plot, and this distribution is roughly straight. I mean, it's not very straight, but it's going over one, two, uh, one, two, three, three, sort of more than three orders of magnitude. It's clearly a very long-tail distribution of the rate at which you find different pairs. All right, so it means there is no typical scale in this distribution. Yes. <coughs> this? Yeah. Mm. 
Not that I know. No. All right. So I think this is actually a very important result because most sort of population genetics models and coalescent theory models assume that you start from some population that is sort of equally mixing, where all the members of the population are sort of identical and interchangeable. And maybe you have subpopulations with some things, with some uh, migration between them, but the basic entities are groups of individuals that are, can be considered interchangeable for your stochastic process. And this, to me, sort of suggests that that's already fundamentally a wrong approach. It's if I look at all these strains that I have, they have a sort of identity that says for any pair of strains, there is a different rate at which they're recombining, and these rates are picked from a very long tail distribution. Okay. So you can play this game also for um, higher groups, right? So you can take triplets, right? And I, now, now I look at, at columns where there is a group of three guys that share one letter and everybody else has another letter. And then I can ask, how often do I see each possible triplet and make a distribution of that? And so this is for triplets, this is for quartets, this is for quintets, this is for groups of 12 guys. And you see that no matter what you pick, for all these um, subsets, the distribution of the relative occurrences of these uh, different types is roughly power law, although the slopes of these power laws are changing a bit. This is also true for other strains. So here is Glamidia. Um, here is Staphylococcus aureus, Salmonella. Um, here's the human genome. We went to uh, 1,000 human genome alignments. We played the same game. We just went to all the columns and asked, what's the distribution of a pair of individuals sharing a SNP that everybody else knows how to triplet? So here you also find very good power laws. Slopes of this power law are all relatively close to three. But they're different. So here's a summary, right? So this is for pairs, triplets, sorry, single, pairs, triplets, quartet, five, and so on. These were the exponents of the power laws for the bacteria that I showed you. This is the exponents for human. So human is clearly different and it's kind of flat, whereas here the sort of the exponent is still seem to be going up a bit. And so the way I think about this is that these um, frequency distributions of these N SNPs, as I call them, tell you something about the population structure. It tells you sort of how much structure is of the population, how biased, skewed is the distribution of the rates at which different pairs of strains are recombining. And when you look at two SNPs, you're looking at recent events, right? So these are events that were a reason that only a pair shared them. Three SNPs are further back in time. Four SNPs are further back in time. So as these exponents are telling you, they're telling you something about how the skewness of the population structure is, is changing as you go further back in time. Okay? Now, what exactly it encodes about the population structure, I have not yet really worked out. Okay? I'm still playing around with what kind of models would give you these kind of power law distributions, and it's not so obvious, because either all the models that exist start from assuming uh, interchangeable entities. Okay? All right, so this is the guys that did this work. Uh, Chris Field did all the phenotyping, genome sequencing, genome assembly, gene annotation, ortology alignment. And Thomas Sakoparni worked on the, the phylogeny and the, and the SNP statistics. So to just a summary, right, for most pairs of E. coli strains, none of the DNA in their alignment stems from their clonal ancestor. All of it has been recombined. And for a typical pair, just maybe 10, 20 times overwritten since they had the common ancestor. So recombination drives genome evolution. It introduces substitutions at all, almost tenfold higher rate than point mutations. You cannot reconstruct the clonal phylogeny of the sequences from DNA. And the apparent phylogenetic structure that you get when you make a tree, which is what everybody does, is not reflecting ancestry, but it's reflecting population structure. And instead of there being a single recombining population, 
or separate subpopulations, there is actually a long-tailed continuum of different rates at which different guys are recombining with each other. And uh, we think that you can characterize this by these exponents of these n-snoops distributions. All right. Okay. So I think I'm going to... That was all the material that I prepared for one less lecture, right? Um, so uh, I think I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. He's coming. So the, the final part of your talk yes. with the power laws, yes. is that then consistent with one of the early things you said where most of the sites should have just two different uh, SNPs? Is, is yes, it, and that's because still the, uh, it's still true for any, any, okay, so any position still has a phylogeny. And whether you get mostly zero or one is basically just uh, of what is the total time until you get to the final common ancestor of all 92. And that's still reasoned enough for DZ coli that for almost all these trees, there is just zero or one mutation. That's at least what I believe. Does it make sense to go in a uh, multi-level tree market fashion? So you could take the con most conserved genes in the E. coli and make a tree, rough tree out of that, get some subpopulation groups, and then make a horizontal gene transfer tree between them. Does that make sense? I'm not quite understanding. So uh, oh, what do you, yeah, you what could do you take uh, some genes which are more conserved, make a tree out of that to get subpopulations of E. coli which are more closely related and now within them, with the SNPs, make a horizontal gene transfer tree. One a vertical tree, one a... But I still need to find... Okay, so yes. Okay, so maybe an answer to give this is that... So, there are many... Um, there's a bunch of algorithms that have been de developed that try to first take the whole genome and reconstruct the clonal phylogeny from the whole genome alignment and then go back to the single genes and ask, can I now estimate what horizontal transfer events occurred for this gene? Okay, so there's, there are algorithms for, 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 doing, for doing such things and some you know, fairly sophisticated algorithms. However, it does require that you know the clonal tree. You need to know that cell division tree. And what I'm arguing here is that the DNA sequences simply do not contain the information to reconstruct it. So there is just no way for you to know what are the true clonal relationships of your strains. Even for a very highly conserved gene, this will not be true. Yes, even for a very highly conserved gene, this will not be true. Yes, there is no, okay, so that's another thing that some people believe, right? Sometimes you hear people sort of, most of the time people just wave their hands actually, but, but they sort of suggest, well, there are subsets of genes that are the most conserved genes, essential genes, that, um, which are not hit by recombination. And there's an assumption that there's a subset of genes which are not hit by recombination, and you can make the, the tree from those. But we don't find any evidence that that's true. And we, we, it looks to us like every, every region of the genome is hit. Don't find any regions that are not hit. Okay, I think you were first. And then I... Okay. Sorry. Okay, yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Um, it is interesting to note that um, most of the uh, oh, recombination actually drives uh, genome evolution in the example that you have shown in, uh, rather than looking at single nucleotide polymorphisms, uh, which is maybe logical for organisms like this that may pass through transformation or horizontal transfer, and also organisms, eukaryotic organisms that probably have uh, part of their life cycle in 
another species that will facilitate recombination, like Plasmodium, for example. But looking at other organisms like Entamoeba, Histolytica, Hatmani, that do not have another life cycle in another organism, and probably we may not foresee transformation or horizontal transfer. Will you predict that? I'm not going to predict anything. <laughs> I'm just going to say, please point me to a nice collection of genomes of such an organism, and I will do the analysis, and I will tell you if it looks like they also recombine or not. Because it's true that, I mean, when I give this talk, I always have people that say, but I know organisms that don't do this. And, for example, there were people that told me, for sure, Staphylococcus don't do this. Uh, we had data for Staphylococcus. Well, they do do this. For sure, Mycobacterium tuberculosis doesn't do this. Okay? Well, they are all too close to tell, but we see clear recombination between them happening. Okay, so... Uh, I'm happy to believe that there are, you know, there are these, these things that look like Buchnera that lives in an aphid and has to go from the aphid to the thing, where it's hard to imagine when they would recombine. So I wouldn't be surprised that you can find organisms that don't do it. So I, I agree with you, but I'd like to see it <laughs> before I, you know, really, really believe it. Um, yeah, so this is uh, related to an earlier graph you'd shown. I, I just forgot. So you'd shown this graph of, I think, the number of genes. Um, just, tell, just say stop. Yeah, this one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, w w I mean, what is your guess as to why there is that much variation uh, about, the, about the red line? So these guys, they are very close, all right? And basically, this, this is now on a linear scale, right? So they have very few, relatively speaking, genes between them. So this is why it's tight. Now, from here onward, you have fully recombined. Okay? And so then, whether you're far apart, so these are these guys at 8%. These are from these pairs at 8%, right? And this is all the other normal E. coli's. Um, how far exactly you are here is really a function of what are the regions that you have recombined. Yeah, so if, if you're really saying this guy has a set of regions that came from guys that are relatively distal from the regions that this other guy has, and somehow the average number of genes that you've now picked up that are different are, are scaling logarithmically, and I won't, I'm not sort of surprised that the variance also increases. All right, so, and maybe this is useful to know that the way this works, right, is that Okay, so there's a segment on the genome where there are, let's say, 10 genes. And now, through this phage infecting you, now a segment comes in from another E. coli whose edges are identical to my segment of 10 genes, but actually that guy had one extra gene. So there were 11, somewhere in the middle was... And if you now homologously recombine it, now you have an extra gene. Right? So the way that they change their gene content is actually by this exchange of pieces whose edges are the same, but where in the middle the genes are not the same. All right? And so now this... Okay, so we, we're always thinking, oh, but that is sort of making it very non-trivial, right? Because you can only recombine when the edges match, so you can't sort of randomly recombine with other parts. You always need matching edges. So now you can think of how is this going to go, given all the edges I have, what things can exchange, what things cannot exchange. The other thing I should say is that this homologous recombination requires that the, the edges are similar. And so basically it's been estimated every time you, ha you go 1.5% out, the, the, there is an e one e-fold lowering of the rate of success of homologous recombination. So by the time you're at 10% distance, homologous recombination doesn't really work anymore. And that can give you sort of like a species isolation, right? So once a group of bacteria has gone more than 10% distance of other ones, the rate of exchange between them is really suppressed. But on this scale of just a few percent, we don't really see evidence of that. Sorry, somewhere.
Yeah, so I think we don't have enough variation in distances. Ah, so Luca was suggesting maybe this, the fact that the um, rate of recombination exponentially depends on how close the pair is, can give you this, uh, can give you this um, power law distribution of recombination rates. But I think that in our data, the guys are all too close. There is not enough change over this range to explain this very large range of recombination rates. Um, you started by saying that the sort of global diversity of E. coli is sampled on the shore of uh, Lake Superior. But since now you've come to tell us that there is no notion, um, so presumably all those assignments of E. coli species were based on some subset of genes or some such thing. So it could be that what you're saying is the global complement of all allelic variation is found at Lake Superior, but the, but the rebundling of it is not. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. So, so how does your whole um, analysis now connect back to the, is this now surprising, is this not surprising, the fact that we see apparently all of global diversity in, in one small mud patch? Ah. Yeah, that's a very good question, Mukund. I have not really thought this through enough to really give you an answer right now. I mean, my, okay, so the first thing that, that I sort of took from this is that sort of the closest pair that we have, their, their SNP rate in ancestral regions is about 10 to the minus 5, which means 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5 generations is the closest pair that I have in my set. All right, so um, now how many generations they do per year in the wild, I don't know. But if you say 100, then it's still like a 1,000 years since these guys had a common ancestor. And my intuition is E. coli can mix around the globe on that time scale. And that's why I can find that the nearest neighbor of my guy here is that guy over there. And then you will find that that was a guy in Florida who had diarrhea or whatever, or something like this, right? And uh, it's actually fun to play this game. <laughs> <laughs> and see where was that bacterium isolated that is close to one of my E. coli. So, so I was just thinking, well, they just, I find guys from everywhere because they mix on this time scale. Um, but you're asking about if also sort of like the allele repertoire in each gene is also represented. And that is a very good question. I have not really uh, looked at. Um, so, what if, if the tree is not the proper mathematical structure to capture such a phenomenon as recombination? All right, so I, I um, yeah, okay, that's good, but then what is? Uh, uh, the, 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 I still believe that every nucleotide in the genome there is a tree. That still holds. Okay? There is a unique phylogeny history of replication events that led to this letter, this homologous letter. Um, so you have to think of a distribution over trees. Right? So basically every position in the genome, in my alignment, is one tree, and those trees are taken from some distribution. And basically, in coalescent models and so on that are used, people have models of these distributions. However, it's sort of assumed that the identity of the guys at the leaves are interchangeable in those distributions. And so basically, what this says is that assumption you have to, you have to drop. You have to write down some stochastic process that says there is some structure that these guys have. So when I'm thinking about this, I think there's, maybe there's some abstract space where you can place each E. coli in this space, and then they can only recombine when they're near each other in this space, or the probability that they recombine drops as you, and, and, and so, you know, 
they move around in the space and divide and so on, and the, and the recombination uh, is proportional to the distance in the space. And then if you assume that the number of neighbors at a certain distance goes up exponentially with distance in the space, then that, that can combine with exponential falling of the rate of recombination with distance to give you power law distribution. So that's sort of the way I'm starting to think about how this can, how you can get these statistics, but I haven't been able to make it work when the rubber really hits the road. I just wave my hands a bit, but I haven't really made it work yet. Does it answer your question? I mean, there are, for example, people, maybe you're referring to this, right, that, that do, uh, instead of uh, uh, phylogenetic trees, that do networks, right? So there's a number of computer scientists that work on, the, on these things of putting alleles on networks rather than on trees, and I've talked to some of them to see if, if that would be an abstraction that would be useful. And the problem that I have with this is, is that it's very hard to map what's happening physically and in evolution to the way they represent these things mathematically. And so I think it didn't help me in the end to, to, to think of it like that. So this is the data from uh, three sample points, right? Uh, from the, near the Lake Superior. Yeah, the, I think there is, um, so, okay. So the details of this is these five plates over one month in 2006 and from three locations. Okay, three locations. Yes, either so, the water side or wet soil at the edge of the water or one meter up. And now you're gonna ask me, is there any correlation by where you go in this tree and where you were sampled and what day you were sampled? Yeah. No. So I was just going to ask if it fits well with the, uh, all the analysis. Uh, which has been done with the... Um, yeah, well, it, it certainly doesn't contradict it. It says there is not a very clear association between what day and in what precise location you were sampled. So the, do they, are they evolutionary, like, like if we reconstruct the trees for each data points, like each locations, yeah. are, are they clustered together? No, 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 they, they, they have the same representation. Find some guys that were all from the soil and that were on one day and they're in, in one group, but then next to it is a guy that came from the water and from another day that also goes in this group, right? So it, there is very little association. Thanks. Um, if there are no further questions about this talk, then I'd like to ask a question about the talk that you did not give. Um, which is about the phenotypic effects. Huh. Um, is there any uh, evidence of all this that you've described? Want it all. Huh? Huh? <laughs> you want it all. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so is there any um, sort of uh, uh, imprint of all this in, uh, uh, in the phenotypic analysis that you might have done? Or anything else that, that you would like to tell us about them? Okay, so I'll tell you what, what is the bottom line about the phenotypes. Um, maybe I'll show you one or two slides then, if you, uh, let's go to all this. All right, this is just telling us how we do it, doesn't matter. I mean, one thing that I can tell you is that I was naive and when I started doing this, I uh, actually, I used sort of startup funds for my lab and so on to buy a photospectrometer and a robot so that I could do growth curves of all these bacteria in many, many, many environments. And my plan was that for each strain in each environment, I'm going to measure its lag time, its growth rate, and its yield. Because when you go to, you know, paper from, by Mono from the 40s and so on, and that's what they say you get from a growth curve. So that's what I thought I was going to measure. And it turns out that it's almost impossible, no, it is impossible to get reproducibly such numbers when you grow these wild strains in these little microtiter wells. So this is just an observation. And when you go to a bacterial expert and you tell him that, 
They say, oh, in micro tighter plates? No, 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 it has to be a big flask. I say, why has to be a big flask? Uh, yeah, it has to be a big flask. Okay? And also, you know, you just wake them up from uh, the freezer and you do one overnight? No, 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 no. You have to transfer them for a couple of days in the big flask and then only measure at the end. Okay, so, you know, so there's this whole lore that they know when you go to these little wells and do things that you might get. So we find that some strain in the same condition, one day it grows like this, another day it grows exactly the same way, the growth curve is identical. On a third way, it, it third day it grows at half the speed. And uh, and then we say, is it where it's on the plate and this and that and that? And we control the temperature to 0.1 degrees and make sure it's the same batch of media and then and then and you can reduce a bit of the variance. But, but so okay. So what I came away there. So it's very interesting. Why is this? What I came away is that. Whatever it is that E. coli is selected for in the wild, it is not to show reproducible growth curves. Because in the wild, the conditions are not as controlled as I make them in the lab. And we cannot make them do reproducibly the same thing, so they do not care to do reproducibly. So in the end, the one thing that we could do reproducibly was to just do yes, no, can you grow or not? And, you, and we grow them on plates, agar plates, and we use a scanner to say, is there a colony or not? That's very reproducible. So we did uh, different carbon sources, nitrogen sources, 61 different stress conditions, six antibiotics, sometimes at multiple concentrations. These are sort of what these pictures look like. Okay, so here each strain has a quartet and on three plates. Okay, so you see that there are these sort of holes where there are squares that are of four that are missing, that didn't grow, and other ones that did grow. Um, so now if we do the image analysis, so Chris developed some image analysis to call whether there is a colony or not. And so if you now look at sort of the reproducibility, so notice there is three times four replicates for each strain, right? There is three plates and four per, per plate is that most of the time it's either zero or 12 colonies, and it's very rare that you get something in between. So there's, there we, now we say, okay, we can call growth, non-growth for each of these conditions, each of these strains. Um, so if you now ask, what is the fraction of conditions in which each strain grows? Then it varies from strains that grow in 80% of the conditions to strains that grow in 25% of the condition. And it's a single hump distribution. Most of them grow in half of the conditions we tested them in. And of course, we made sure to, test, to take conditions where there is variation. Okay, because we could have done 100 times, do you like even more glucose or even more glucose? And then they would have said, yes, we all grow, right? So we picked these conditions to have some information in them. And so for our guys, it's sort of uh, typically you grow in 50%, but there's some variation. Now, if you go in the conditions, look at the conditions and say, how many conditions are there where between zero and six of the strains grew, seven to 13, up to, you know, all of them, then you get this sort of bimodal distribution. So there are many conditions where they were really nasty and only one or two or three guys managed to grow. There are many conditions that are great and almost everybody grows, but it's rare to find a condition where exactly half of them grow. So that, that's another observation. Uh, oh, that's it. Um, so now I'll tell you, okay, what are the results? So we did many kind of these GWAS things, trying to associate whether you can, genome-wide association studies, that stands for, trying to see whether having certain allele of a gene or having a certain gene or missing a certain gene is predictive for whether you grow or not in a given condition. Right, so you can ask what is genotypically special to the subset of guys that grow and not grow in each of these conditions. And, and there it sort of, we didn't get very far because of an embarrassment of riches. In any condition, there are too many genotypic variants that can perfectly explain this condition. And then if you dig down and say, but is the gene the right kind of function and so on, then you find a handful of cases where it looks very convincing. And you say, aha, if you have this operon for eating sucrose, 
known up around for eating sucrose, then you can grow in sucrose, and if you don't have it, you can't grow. So we have maybe a handful of these, but most of them we can't really make sense of the genes that can explain it. So I think we didn't get very far there. Now, the thing that is very surprising is that, um, so as you saw, different guys have different size colonies. These colonies are not all the same size. So Chris figured out if you take the, we always grow in a reference condition, just glucose to make sure that nothing went wrong with the overnight of the cells and that they were alive and so on. So he's done hundreds of plates in the reference condition, and he's worked out for each strain, what is the size of the colonies that you make in the reference condition? Some strains make big colonies, some strains make small colonies. It turns out that that correlates very well with the fraction of conditions that you grow in. So these guys that are sort of the fittest guys that grow in 80% of the colonies, they make big colonies. These guys that only grow in 25%, they make small colonies. No idea why, but there's a good correlation. So this size of your colony in some easy reference condition is predictive for how many stressful conditions you're going to grow in. The other thing is, if you take the whole phenotype matrix, so all the strains by all the conditions, and you do PCA, the first component of the PCA is exactly this. What fraction of conditions you grow in. So it looks like the, f the, the major variation in phenotype is that there are just some very good E. coli that grow in most conditions, and there are very unfit E. coli that grow in few conditions. All right, so now, so that's to me was very surprising because we thought, oh, all this diversity, all these guys coexisting in this environment, probably, you know, some guys have specialized for some things, some guys have specialized for other things. No, the data says, no, 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 there are just fit guys and less fit guys. And that's the first major axis of variation that you find in phenotypes. Then if you ask what in the genotype determines whether you're fit or not fit, right? whether you're here or there, very hard to find something clean. The best thing that we found so far, okay, and then this is the last thing we should stop, is each gene, okay, so I don't know, so this, if you've ever seen these things, you can make another histogram. Where you ask, how many genes are there that occur in only one organism, in one genome? How many are there that occur in two? How many in three? How many in four? So this is number of genes. It's deeper than that. All right, 92, 91. So that's a bimodal distribution again. There are many genes that you find in only one, two, or three organisms. And there are many genes that are either in all, or all but one, all but two and few genes that occur in half of them. And so it mimics this kind of phenotype environment distribution, this one. It's a similar curve, okay? So now what I did is I, I imagine making random genomes, random E. coli, by sampling genes from this distribution. So I go through the list of all genes that occur in at least one genome, which is about 15,000 or something we have. And for each of these, I say, okay, this gene occurs in four out of 92 genome, so the probability that I'm going to add it to my random genome is four over 92. This gene in all, okay, I have to add it. This gene in, nine, okay, so I go and I make random genomes like that. I can also then take the real genomes and ask how likely am I to produce a genome with this gene content under this model? And it turns out that the genomes that are most likely to produce under that model have the highest fitness, and the genomes that have the least likelihood to be produced under this model have the lowest fitness. That is to say, and it's not a very good correlation, but it's the best one we've been able to find. So it says, your high fitness, when you avoid either having rare, strange genes that are rare, and you avoid missing common genes. 
Then you have fitness. If you have missing some common genes or you have strange rare genes, many of them, you tend to be low fitness. And so my sort of zero to order interpretation of this is that recombination is happening and it's bringing in new genes all the time. And it's almost like a mutation in gene content. And by and large, those mutations are deleterious, just like any other mutation. Okay, so the more of that has happened to you and you've got a whole lot of rare genes and lost a couple of common genes, that's going to be bad for you. That's, uh, that's the phenotype story. Uh, unless uh, other people have, so why are these other strains there then? Is there, um, you know, this seems to go against the standard uh, law, right? That uh, uh, yeah. if you're not fit enough, you won't survive there. Yeah, I think I will have a hard time convincing many people. I mean, that this is correct. I mean, so it's very easy to say, look, You've varied carbon source, nitrogen source, you've added some antibiotics, you've added salt, uh, you changed pH, you played in your lab with some variables that you could play with. These are just not the, re the relevant variables for E. coli. The relevant variables are all complicated things about the stuff that occurs in hosts and molecules that you don't even know about and, and, and so on. And that's certainly possible. It's certainly possible that basically, you know, we're testing, uh, uh, we're testing people's ability to do something really, really strange, which would have nothing to do with what people in the wild are selected for, right? <laughs> you know, thumb, put them in a, so. Uh, so it's easy to say that, but I'm just sort of reporting what we see with, with the data we have. And okay, so why do these guys are there? Maybe the differences in fitness are not large enough to re weed them out you know, uh, on this time scale. Right, so uh, maybe a good question would be, thank you actually, because now you made me think of this. Uh, a good question would be, is it true that for every low fit guy, there is a, a high fit guy nearby? Or can I find an entire you know, group of low fit, apparently low fit guys that are far away from any high fit guys, which would mean they must have persisted for a long time. Right? Good idea. I haven't looked, haven't done that yet. Thank you. <laughs>